the uh, period I'm covering today, picking up from last time, is uh, as I entitled it, The Five Good Emperors, Nerva and Trajan. Uh, you don't have to be that bad in math to see that Nerva and Trajan doesn't equal five emperors, but of course what we're talking about is the first two of the five. Uh, we're going to cover 20 years tonight. Uh, very interesting years. They're all interesting. Uh, the year 96 to 116, basically. And uh, drama, war, violence, intrigue, revolution, suppression. And that's before Bar Kokhba even starts. Okay. So, you know, the guy used to say, times were hard, my parents have worked, the banks closed, and then came the Depression. The, uh, it's a period which is silent and passed over in the Jewish sources. It's a problem for me, any historian. If you want to be honest about it, if you don't want to be honest, it's great. Uh, and it's maddeningly unclear. So I'm going to try to s steer the ship through the shoals, I guess, and try to uh, give the best interpretation that I can, because all you ever get here is, you know, is me, uh, of this uh, very important period, very intriguing period in Jewish history, a uh, troubling period. And these are the years 96 to 116, these 20 years are the years of two emperors, uh, Nerva and Trajan, uh, household names. Uh, we left off last time with uh, the evil emperor Domitian, Domitianus, as the uh, emperor of Rome. Uh, the part we care about is he was very anti-Semitic, and uh, he was assassinated in the year uh, 96 by his own servants, which goes to show you uh, pay on time. And with him came the extermination, the downfall of the Flavian dynasty, as they call it. It wasn't a dynasty. It was Vespasian and his two sons. <laughs> Vespasian died. One son took over, probably was bumped off by the other son. The other son eventually got assassinated. Welcome to Rome. You know. uh, so they were there for about 25, 26 years on the throne. And this is what we were talking about beforehand. The immediate 25 years after the destruction of the base of Migdash, because Vespasian and Titus are the guys that brought you the destruction of the base of Migdash. Domitian, the third of them, uh, at that time, in 96, was particularly tyrannical, uh, killing lots of Romans. I mean, at the end of his reign, he was really, he did it all through his reign, but all the, towards the last years, he was really knocking people off right and left on various charges. But as we saw, he was also cracking down hard on the Jews. That's 95 is when he killed Clemens and the others. And uh, as far as we can tell, Domitian stuck his nose even to Jewish life in Eretz Yisrael, in, in, in the province of Judea. And he deeply distrusted the sages and seems to have been planning to take out Rabbi Gamliel, the patriarch, the leading rabbi. Uh, spies, we know. Now, what I'm doing over here is the art form that I told you the other day. There's a statement here, a story there, a tale here, and they never get exactly when and where, but if you kind of know how to put it together, or you sort of artistically feel how to put it together, you can sort of tell when this is happening, but you've got to know a lot to be able to do it. The, um, we have a story, for example, a very interesting one in the Sifri, early halachic midrash, that uh, once upon a time, uh, the Roman government sent a couple of spies to infiltrate the yeshiva, okay? And the yeshiva here, that's, that's my fault. <laughs> Can you believe this? Shame on me. The, uh, the fact is that uh, Sergiotis, they, so ma um, imagine what I'm talking about. The KTB sends people to infiltrate the Pontifex Yeshiva. That's what it boils down to. And they were obviously very good. They must have been trained very well to get in. And they were there for a number of years. And they learned about Welt. And they did very well. And then afterwards, at one point, they the <laughs> FBI. <laughs> you know, they present their credentials. They're over the Oh, my God. And what's going to happen over here? You know, what kind of report are you going to give? And they said, like, I said, we'll give you a good report. Uh, Torah, no mishubachasi. The, 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 the stuff that I've learned over here in the Torah Shabbat, the oral law, the Talmud, and all those rules and regulations, um, I see it's a civilization. It's not a terrorism. It's a, it's a set of laws. Uh, and it's no mishubachasi. It's pretty. It makes sense. It's an admirable, admirable culture. Um, and 99% of what you did uh, could find approval anywhere. 1% we didn't like. And what was the 1%? I'm telling you the way the, the story is told in the Sifri, in the Midrash. And it, what is the 1% that it's over there? What I told you the other day, the particularism. So why is it that Sharshal Yehudi Shanagah Sharshal Goy is a putter, and Sharshal Goy Shanagah Sharshal Yehudi is Chayev? 
Why is it, according to your laws, if a Jew's ox gores someone else's ox, you don't have to pay. If the other guy gores a Jew's ox, you do have to pay. That doesn't make any sense. But since it's the exception, we're not going to tell. <laughs> right? Notice, if, I would t if I, we put this at the top of the list for Domitian, or to be honest, if we put it at the bottom of the list for Domitian, he'll kill you all. Because he's looking for that one thing. But since we see overall, we ourselves can tell that basically it's a harmless religion, so we won't tell. Well, what's this business about sending the KGB in order to infiltrate the Panovich Yeshiva? You see that Domitian, in his time, is looking for uh, the plot that he sees or wants to see. And with these kind of guys like Stalin, you know, first they shoot you, then they have the trial. So uh, they very close uh, call. And it's, it speaks very well, the atmosphere in the 90s of the kind of reign of terror that's going over there. As I mentioned the first night of here, you kind of start to understand why Rabbi Gamil was so uh, particularistic about who he would not admit into the base medrash. Uh, highly restrictive uh, admissions policy. It wasn't for being snobbish, but it, it's very dangerous, you understand? Uh, we have no, thank God we have no idea like that, what's going on in, in this country, in our culture. But uh, it's, it's no joke. And there's another uh, famous story that says that uh, once upon a time, uh, in, the Gemara, in the Gemara, they, they said, Rabbi Gamliel, uh, the guy with the big nose, Balachotem Misbakesh, the guy with the big nose is, is, is sought, which means there's a warrant arrest out for the guy with the big nose, which was Rabbi Gamliel. And when he heard it, he ran and he had to hide, like Anne Frank. And uh, what's that all about? Once again, you see that the Roman authorities, under prodding from the emperor, are uh, preparing lists. And they want to know who's important in the rabbinic culture and take them out. You know, they'll have a one way ride. And uh, this is Domitian. And so it was really tough. Um, he was, at the end of his life, not that he knew it was the end, he wasn't old when he got killed. He was clear he was preparing a crackdown. Uh, perhaps Domitian was really ticked off by all the Judaizing that we talked about before. He seems to have been really freaked out over that. It, you know, he killed out uh, Clemens and others. Uh, people were penalized very heavily during, the, especially the last decade of his reign, for Judaizing or anything like that. And I'm talking about Romans who do it, of course. Um, so it was really rough and uh, thus he was bumped off right at the right moment uh, on the first day of Sukkot on the year 96 I just looked up the English date and matched it with the Hebrew date so it was a Yontif now uh, the Senate, the Roman Senate hated and feared Domitian uh, they had just gone, I mean let's put it this way if you were a Roman Senate in the first century it wasn't fun, first you had Tiberius then you had Caligula, then you had Nero then you got Domitian Genugshan, you know the, uh, it got to the point that any, emperor, any senator that looked like he had money or a pretty wife or lands or anything like that, next thing you know, he's up on charges. And so it was a reign of terror, and rich people don't like to live in a reign of terror. The poor are used to it, but the rich don't like to live like that way. And so they hated and feared him. And once he was killed by his own men, uh, there was no move to punish the assassins. They immediately uh, appointed a senior senator, like we would say today, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, to be the next emperor. Which is interesting. They're worried about uh, civil war, to worry about who knows who will grab the throne. Uh, when Nero died and nobody knew what to do, it was the year of the three emperors, really, the four emperors, Galba, Asa, Vitelli, Vespasian, civil wars, they didn't want that. And so, get a nice, safe individual over there, and they got this relatively older fellow, who's close to 70, um, childless, 69-year-old uh, senator, no children, so if he's got nothing, uh, you know, he might as well be honest. And uh, his name was Marcus Quisius Nerva, who had been a well-known senator for decades. You understand, he had survived with Nero, with Vespasian, and all the others. And uh, he immediately said to the Senate, in a famous speech, that I will not be another Domitianus. You know, it's, it's my, my policy is safety first, and let's go back to normal. Okay? Let's go back to normal. Uh, basically, everybody was in the same mood. He didn't use these words, but it's famous in the Tanakh, where uh, Abner says, Halo Netzach Tochel Cherev, you know, shall the sword go on forever? Enough. We've had enough of these killings. Uh, now, I like that, and you like that. Problem is, uh, this is not uh, Baltimore, and it's not a club. Uh, this was the Roman Empire. Nerva was weak. The kind of person who says, I'll let this go, I won't punish this one. Then you lose your fear. What's Machiavelli say? A leader, above all, needs to be feared, not loved. Right? And so, what's going on over here? Many could see that he's kind of weak character. He's too nice of a guy, and all that sort of thing. Uh, people told him that pe they're plotting against him. He said, ah, don't worry about it. This is the wrong attitude for Rome. And so after a year of weak rule, uh, the army got more and more arrested, and the generals came to him one day and said, look, you're old, you want to kick the bucket one of these days. Who's going to be uh, coming after you? Um, 
we don't really like you that much. Uh, you're not the type of guy to inspire confidence. Uh, we're not going to kill you if. And the if is, no, no, but they, it, was, it was logical what they said. They said, uh, appoint a young and vigorous guy as your successor, and the army will support you while you live. Otherwise, we'll kill you right now. So which is it? And, uh, you know, so uh, he said yes. And whoever it is that he wanted to appoint, the guy that they kind of pushed him to appoint was, surprise, surprise, the top general in the army. Okay? So he made Douglas MacArthur, Franklin Roosevelt appointed Douglas MacArthur as his successor. Uh, Roosevelt wouldn't last two minutes that way. But this guy lasted a year. They weren't out to kill him. He was old anyway. So they figured they can wait. And um, faced with this threat, look, he, he, he did the wise thing. And when he said the wise thing, he appointed the most popular uh, general. And therefore, the army will support them. And for the last year of his life, when it was raining, that is how it went. Uh, the guy he appointed was uh, Marcus Trajan, uh, 44 years old, uh, the most popular uh, military officer. And uh, within a year, he died. And Trajan became the emperor without any fights. And everybody considered it was a good deal. Um, listen, no one's going to contest his succession. Take a look at the guy, you know. And, uh, and he was the most celebrated soldier in the Roman army. He was a soldier soldier, meaning he was one of these charismatic guys that he left from the front. He slept with, in, in, the, in the snow with the other soldiers, you know, that sort of thing. He didn't, he didn't uh, live high and mighty. And uh, the soldiers therefore loved him. Uh, during the two short years, therefore, 96 to 98, when Trajan was the emperor, he pushed through some liberal measures. It's interesting. And uh, he seems to have been a nice guy, which is very unusual for emperors, which might be one of the reasons it didn't last that long. Uh, look, he, he banned treason trials. This is not done in Rome. Uh, he pardoned political criminals. That they saw was just counterintuitive. They didn't get that, you see. Uh, he discouraged informers. This, this is not the way to succeed after you know, Nero and, 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 and Domitian and, and, and those type of guys. Um, he, one of the very first liberal, within a month of office, this is just interesting, one of the very first liberal things he did involved the Jews. It actually involved what we call the Fiscus Judaeus, Judaeus, which is the Jewish coin. And uh, that's a picture of it. The, uh, basically, uh, when the base of Migdus was uh, captured and destroyed, Vespasian, as part of his raising money, said that all the Jews in the Roman Empire, since they're all Jews, have to give the Maxis a shekel that they used to send to the base of Migdus anyway, now you have to give the Rome. In Roman coins, it's two denarii, two dinars. Okay? And from then on, for the next couple hundred years, to the 400s, every Jew once a year had to give Maxis a shekel to, to Rome. Uh, I don't know if he did it on purpose. The money goes to support the Church of Jupiter, the Temple of Jupiter, which is, uh, you know, according to Jewish law, uh, and, uh, well, you're not allowed to really support a base of Uruzar, but guess what? They don't make choice. And, and that's the way it ran for a couple hundred years, okay? Um, now, there's all kinds of ways of connecting the, collecting the taxes. Under uh, Domitian, he turned it into something really uh, tough. Uh, it wouldn't make very humiliating. Uh, they would make every person, uh, for example, appear before the tax commission and they pull his pants down to see if he's circumcised. Even people who are 90 years old, Suetonius writes about this, he was at such a session. And various things of this nature, um, all of which was part of Domitian's policy of trying to discourage people from wanting to be Jewish. You see? And it uh, makes sense. He even said, if you're Jewish, but then you switch to pagan, you don't have to pay the tax anymore. And so it was very kind of, what shall I say, um, uh, not shameful, but humiliating uh, sort of procedure. And that was the point. So it's bad enough that the Jews had to pay the sex or tax, although Moxa Shal was not a fortune. And it's bad enough they had to pay for the Temple of Jupiter, but if you do it in all this kind of uh, officious, a very bureaucratic fashion designed to humiliate the Jew, so it really ticked people off. And it may be true, we don't know why he did it. Okay? All we do know is that he, it, it, that he did within a month of coming into office, and the reason, what you see over here is, is a famous uh, a picture. Uh, this was the original Fisk of Judeus. Vespasian issued a coin, and you can, if you look on both sides, you can see Judea capta, right? Judea has been captured, right? Eudea, I-U, see the V, it looks like a U, or the other way around. So you can see Judea capta, and that's the classic coin that the Romans put out when they destroyed the Jewish state. And uh, Nerva, uh, as they say before, he uh, ended the abuses of the taxes that he said. So you still got to pay the Mox Hashem because money is money, and Rome's not going to give up money any more than Uncle Sam is. Um, and many writers, by the way, get it wrong. 
uh, I saw the Halevi or Victor Miller, and they say he abolished the Jewish tax. That's, that's not true. But nevertheless, um, he said like this, we're going to ease up on this anti-Semitic administration policy of how you go around collecting the taxes. Give him a little dignity. Just get the money and leave him alone. And he actually issued a coin within a month. There you have it. There's Nerva on one side. You can see it, can't you? There, there, there's a, oops, excuse me. There's Nerva right over here. And if you look over there, you can see the word fiscus. It's a very famous coin. Fisci Judaici, Judaici, the Jewish uh, 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 coin tax, calumnia sublata, the calumny or the shame has now been obliterated. You see? So as I say, it doesn't mean that they got rid of the Jewish tax, but it's how you do it. And that's sending a message too. And I want to tell you something. That's as good as going to get in the first century for an emperor. Right? The guy's not going to put on tzitzit. I mean, this, 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 this is as good as it's going to get. And uh, from the Jewish point of view, is the shame is only in there for, for two years. Um, according to some, we'll never know, uh, historians, especially from historians, have always been fascinated by this little blip of an episode. Again, it came and went real fast. And why would somebody do this? And therefore, a lot of speculation, imagination. We'll never know. You can make novels out of it. They have. That's a, a Kiva by Marcus uh, Lehman. And they'll make a movie about it tomorrow. Um, according to some, the sages went to Rome immediately upon hearing of the new emperor and successfully lobbied him. Uh, it's an intriguing kind of notion that they hear Domitian died and they jump on the boat and they run over there. The problem is it took a month to, for the news to get here anyway, so it doesn't quite work out. And um, we do nevertheless have a lot of these intriguing stories, especially that run along the following lines. Once upon a time, the sages all get on a boat and uh, they forgot to uh, sell the hummocks, and so they have to sell the hummocks on the ship. Why, why didn't they take uh, precautions before? And Rabbi Gamliel was a religious guy. Once upon a time, they're on a boat, and there's no lulav, and Rabbi uh, Gamliel pays $1,000 uh, for a lulav. Why didn't they have a lulav? It's on the boat. You see, he's getting there real quick. Once upon a time, uh, they, they, they get off the boat, and all of a sudden they find themselves in B'nai Brock at the uh, house of Rabbi Kiel. Why didn't they go back to their own house? Oh, B'nai Brock was real uh, fast, and the boat came back just when it came back. There are a lot of these boat kind of stories that are really intriguing and fascinating if you try to coordinate with the historic period, because they did live in the 90s among other era, among other decades, and it fits in very good. Um, they, they debate about whether you make a sukkah on the ship. I mean, why are they doing that? What are they doing on a ship on sukkahs, you see? Unless you say, let's get to Rome right away. Uh, like I say, the trouble is the timing doesn't really work out so well, but let's not get the uh, facts in the way of a good story. These, these stories have become staples, I would say, of the modern from historiography, actually. So uh, say leave the facts out, and it's very nice. Unfortunately, unfortunately, in the big picture, it didn't matter, because Nerva was here and gone. He was there for two years, a uh, year and a half, actually, or so. And the new guy, Trajan, pretty doggone anti-Semitic, he's there for 20 years. Uh, Trajan would rule two decades, and it would not be good for the Jews. From the Gentile point of view, a Trajan is considered one of the greatest emperors. And now begins a century, or close to a century, in which Edward Gibbon, remember him, wrote the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, says what well, the happiest century in human history, because the Roman Empire was ruled by five normal people. And this is how he puts it. Uh, because he had Nerva, and Trajan, and Hadrian, then Antoninus Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. And each one of these guys was normal. None of them were particularly tyrannical. They weren't Milk toast like Nerva necessarily, they did their share of knocking off of people when necessary, but anybody who kills only when necessary is considered a big sonic by Roman standards. And uh, uh, basically they were rational, you follow? As they tried to run the empire on a pretty even keel, and the result was that the Roman Empire was pretty prosperous. Because think about it, the Roman Empire controls the entire Mediterranean, which means there's no piracy, because pirates always depend on having a country to run away to, like it's today. They're terrorists, if you would take away all their uh, layers, they couldn't practice terrorism, you see? And uh, therefore it was Mare Nostrum, it was our lake, our sea. And the, the commerce flowed like crazy, back and forth. The Roman Empire does kind of make sense as an economic unit. You got the East, you got the West, you got the Africa part, you got the Europe part, the, the resources, if they're intelligently managed, and if the econ economy runs along pretty so sound lines, you can have a great prosperity, and that kind of really did happen. Uh, during this period. There were no foreign invasions because Rome was pretty strong, uh, with a few exceptions, and uh, life was, so to speak, good. Therefore, Gibbon would say, oh, look what a great and wonderful time it was. That's if you're not Jewish. If you're Jewish, it wasn't the five great emperors. You understand? And Trajan particularly, and Hadrian after him. Um, it is what it is. Trajan uh, had been a general, 
his father had been a general. His father was one of the generals on Tishabov, who destroyed the base of Migdash. His father was commander of the 10th Legion. 10th Legion was the main legion that was fighting on Tishabov, destroying the base of Migdash. You understand? Uh, they were Spanish, meaning they're Romans who had, whose family had emigrated to Spain long before they were Romans. And Trajan, the first guy not born in Italy to become an emperor, if, if next time you have one of those uh, crossword puzzle questions. And, uh, and he grew up uh, in the army. Therefore, uh, he had abilities. You know, he rose uh, in the rank. He was an aristocrat, but he rose you know, from lieutenant all the way up to general, as, as it works out. And um, when he came on the throne, he had some pretty strong ideas of what it is that he wanted to do. Uh, he spent the first 10 years of his reign, 96 to 106 or, or thereabouts, uh, trying to expand the Roman Empire in Europe. This is very interesting. This is a map of Europe, obviously, and the shaded areas of the Roman Empire. I'll tell you why I'm pointing, why I, I, I got this map. In the old days especially, even nowadays, but in the old days especially, the rivers are everything, because they didn't have roads. And so the natural road is the river. And that's what a lot of life and commerce uh, depends on. Furthermore, a river is a good barrier. Would you agree with that? I don't mean a little stream, but something looks like a Mississippi River. It's a good barrier. Halavai, Israel should be surrounded by rivers that keep the others away. That's the old line. The Roman Empire was kind of scientifically uh, created. I'll tell you what I mean. There's two big rivers that cut Europe in half. All right? Here's the Rhine River. Let's look what I'm doing. All the way down there to there. There's the Rhine River. And there's the Danube all the way to there. You see? And they're both big rivers. As so a result is they almost touch. And look what the Romans did. It's the Rhine and the Danube frontier. Meaning, that's how you keep the barbarians out. Uh, by the time we're talking about the Romans, I guess, in here is civilization, in here is wealth, in here is commerce, uh, you know, organ organization out there, the barbarians, the main point is to keep them out. And if here's Rome, where I'm pointing right here, you know, it's in Italy, so they're far away and everything's great. You see? And the main idea is keep them out of my neighborhood. That was the basic idea. Problem is, there's an endless group of barbarians running all the way there to Siberia, to Mongolia. They really are. It goes like that. Here's Russia all the way to Asia, right? That, that, is, that is actually how it goes. And they're in line. You wipe one group out, the next one comes in their place. So there's no way to solve the problem. It's the only way of managing the problem. Isn't that right? When someone, chas v'shalom, has a medical condition or something else that you can't solve, the only thing you can do is manage it. So the Romans were smart, smart enough, and they realized that you'll never make the Roman Empire totally impervious. There's no way of cutting this off and putting it out to sea. And so you're always going to have to live with this, but keep them far away. Trajan came up from this school. And what he wanted to do, what he should have done from the Roman point of view, is push the frontier. Why should it be the Rhine and the Danube? Why can't it be, let's say, for example, the Nyasta River and the Elba River, right? Or maybe the Oder River and the Nyapa River, right? You see what I'm saying? And if you do that, do, do, do you see how the lines work? Notice, conquer up to here and up to here, these two gigantic rivers, something like that, and keep them even farther away. You see? It could work. The only problem is you have to exterminate all the barbarians here. But, uh, you know, uh, but that's no problem. For, and notice, they don't have any moral issues over that, any more than the barbarians would have killing out all the Romans. This is the good old days. Geneva Convention didn't exist as a concept. And, you know, dog eat dog, kill, kill, kill. This is, this is the good old days. So the result is that Trajan, uh, when he came to the emperor, he was thinking of going this way. And if he would have stuck to it, uh, he, 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 he was the guy that could do it. He was another Julius Caesar. He was an amazing general. He was the emperor. He was lionized by the troops. As I tell you again, you know, he fought with them in battle. When they were wounded, he used to strip his own thing off to tie the soldier. He knew the art of leadership and charisma. And he was an amazing guy. Unfortunately, he was very anti-Semitic. But aside from that, he was, as, a, as a Roman, he was there. And, you know, let's say like this, if he would keep here concentrating on this, he wouldn't notice the Jews. <laughs> See, that, that's what we wanted. Now, the problem is that uh, I don't want to get too detailed about this, but when Trajan came to the throne, there was the Romanian crisis. Right? Uh, it's not the same Romanian crisis we have today, but it's the Romanian, Romanian crisis. This is Romania. Actually, it was called Dacia, Dacia, right over here. Uh, Trajan took them 10 years. They, f they had fought and beaten Domitian and forced them to sign a milling treaty. Don't worry about it. By the time Tra Trajan came on the throne, they were really bothering the Romans and invading over here. They made a big mistake because now their worst nightmare was on the throne. And it took them 10 years, and they lost some battles, but he wiped them out. He wiped them out, and he moved in new settlers, killed them all, and moved in new settlers, and ever since then it's called Romania. 
from the Romans, right? They were Dacia, 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 they say in English. Um, so they added this whole chalik, and it's very rich too. And by the way, the, Roma the Dacian king, Decabalus, had just stashed away shortly before that a ton and a half of gold and silver. Endless amount of gold and silver. And so Tra Trajan not only conquered the territory, but one of the prisoners showed him the gold and the silver. And so he instantly got, he paid for the war. He also solved a lot of the Roman debt. You know, it was, it was a win-win situation. Now at that point, he should have said like this, look, I did this, now let's take it up to here. All it means is to kill a couple million people here and then we're done. You understand? Shine. Um, but he had fought a lot of time in the German forest and he was already getting in his 50s. So he said, you know, Gnug Shine, that was a little bit too much for him. Uh, but it was a mistake. It was a bit, every historian who knows anything will tell you that was the Romans' big mistake because they could have done it at that time and they would have pushed, they would have gotten more, uh, what's, the, what's the right word, uh, you know, protection room, right? A bigger buffer, a bigger pillow, shall we say. Uh, but he didn't do that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he didn't do that. Um, instead, he decided to do the following. Let's take up a few years in peace after 106. He spent the next six or seven years or so, six years really, you know, just living it up in Rome. For a Roman emperor, living up in Rome, I mean, you're going to laugh at what I'm saying over here, uh, you, you hang around your harem of boys. I mean, that's what, that's what, that's what the Roman emperors were into. Uh, there was like one or two exceptions, and Tracy was not one of them. The uh, fact is that uh, things, no, things were going his way. Uh, the, there was money in the bank. Uh, the, uh, you know, economy worked. Uh, everything was, was fine. And so, you know, the old line, since there's nothing better to do, let's fire the rabbi. So he says, since there's nothing better to do, let's have a war. And this, this was a big mistake on his part, as we'll see. But it triggered off a whole bunch of items in there. Um, but in general, his success made him ambitious. And this was the problem. As I told you, what he should have done is conquer Germany and, and, and so, but he didn't want to do that. And so instead he said, let's go, let's, let's go well, here's the Roman Empire, let's go here, right? Now, if you see closely, this is fairly narrow, even though this map is not 100% accurate, but it's accurate enough. You see how the Romans hold all this area of Israel and Syria and Lebanon and all that, but it's not very wide. Now, part of this is the desert, so there's nothing to go for. But when you get up here and you get over here, then it's a whole different story. Here, we run across the other great kingdom, kingdom that the Romans uh, were pretty evenly matched against. It was Parthia, which no longer exists, of course. Uh, Parthian kingdom was pretty much like Iraq, except it was double the size of Iraq. That's who they were. The Parthians, it doesn't matter where they come from, but they go back to the Greek times, and uh, they were a mixturized uh, warrior c uh, class and caste, and they were tough. They had beaten the Romans on a number of occasions beforehand. Most famously, back in Julius Caesar's time, uh, Marcus Licinius Crassus, one of the famous triumvirate, people, the triumvirs, back when it was Pompey, Caesar, and Crassus. If you go back to that, that that's not a law firm, you know, that was the, <laughs> they were the rulers of Rome. They, uh, uh, Crassus was this wealthy guy and he took, he, he bought himself a giant army and they wiped it out like Custer's last stand. The parts in the Battle of Carre, it's unusual that a Roman army gets totally liquidated, but Crassus pulled it off and, uh, and uh, they lost their eagles, which to the Roman is the biggest chil Hashem possible, you know, it's unbelievable humiliation. And uh, later on, when Augustus was the emperor, he said, look, I don't want to have a war with you. Give me the eagles back. Otherwise, I have to have a war just for, for, for religious purposes. And they gave him the eagles back. You know, it wasn't worth it. And so it goes to show you, that's one famous episode. It's not the only one, in which the two sides were fairly evenly matched. If you go against Parthia, um, you might be able to do it. You might not. And we all know from America's experience, as well as the experience of others in Iraq, that it's a hornet's nest. You really go into the Middle East? I mean, you really want to own all that? Then, then be prepared, you know, for, for what it requires. Trajan thought he could do it. And to be perfectly honest, if he was 10 years younger, maybe he could do it. I mean, you know, he, he was the governor to do it. Second of all, there's always the lure of Alexander the Great. Why did Alexander the Great become famous? He did it. Went into Greece, knocked out the Persians, went into Iraq, went into Iran, went to Afghanistan. He, Alexander the Great fought in Afghanistan. Went into Pakistan, he conquered Pakistan. Went into India, doesn't get better than that, you know? At least for a Roman, okay? To them, Alexander is the greatest person. Look at Plutarch when he wrote his famous book called The Lives of Famous Greeks and Romans, in which he always has one in one. A famous Greek and a famous Roman. A famous Greek and a famous Roman. And after each 
compare, he said compare and contrast, like a high school test. You understand what's comparing? So who's he? Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. Doesn't get better than that. They're the greatest conquerors. So Trajan said, I can do it. I think so. Second of all, that would give Rome a buffer zone, once again, pushing the borders to the east. And there are many arguments you can make about it. You know, you can, you can extend the borders of Rome to the Persian Gulf and access the India trade, you know, all kind of things of this nature. Who cares what the reason is? All we know is that uh, he wants to do it. Until then, Rome was very careful and scared about getting involved in a Vietnam War. But Trajan says, I can win. And uh, the result is that uh, even though he's 60 years old now, he says he wants to do it. My friends, Parthia has the biggest Jewish community in the world, certainly the Frumist. That's the problem. This is, a, this is the part of the empire, which, which this is Iraq today, and southern Iraq, the majority population was Jews. This is the famous Bavel. We told here, Talmud Bavli, right? This is the famous repository of a very large Jewish community. One of the big things about the Jews that everybody knew was, Im Yavo Esav, El Hanisha and the famous story goes, if the Romans are able to even wipe out all the Jews in the Roman Empire, you're still not going to get rid of all the Jews. There's still going to be a lot of Jews left over in the Parthian Empire. And that very fact itself discouraged Roman emperors from taking on the plot. Because if you can finish the whole thing off, like Haman, go for it. You know, that's very tempting. But if you know that even, even if you totally succeed with the empire, there'll be a lot more people left over, it kind of discourages you. And so one of the secrets, one of the secrets, of the Jewish survival was the fact that they were separated in different countries. This takes us back, here we are in the three weeks, this takes us back to a famous debate that raged for many centuries in the ancient, ancient times, even among the rabbis. And that is, is it better for all Jews to live in Israel, or is it better for the Jews to live all over the place? So, sound contemporary? You see? And uh, the Israeli rabbis, surprise, surprise, in the times of the Mishnah beforehand, they said, it's the worst sin of all that all the Jews don't move to Israel. Uh, Rabbi Yochanan, who lived centuries later, said every time a Babylonian student would come, or Rish Lakish, who was another famous Israeli rabbi, every time a student would come, like from America, they go to Israeli yeshivas today, that time he was going from Babylonia to Israeli yeshivas, they say, you Babylonian bums, and you destroyed the base and made all the rest, and the student would say, what I do? He says, if your ancestors would have made Aliyah, well, this is what Ben-Gurion said, if five million American Jews don't give us your money, come over with five million more Jews, and we can swamp the, the Arabs. You got a problem with Hebron? No, you don't. <laughs> you move a million Jews there? You understand? So that's that argument. And then there was Rabbi Chia, who was a Babylonian, who came to the counter-argument. He said, what I just told you, it's a good thing Jews are all in one place, otherwise they all get killed by the Romans. This way they're scattered all over the place. So this is a very commonplace issue that never ends in Jewish history, and it was around at that time as well. And here comes Trajan, who wants to extend the Roman Empire over that community as well. I don't say that's the main reason he was going there, but from the Jewish point of view it was, and from the Jewish point of view, it's a great danger, you see? And they weren't happy with this at all. Um, the Jews of the East, meaning the whole Middle East, including the Roman part, they're well aware that Trajan does not like them. They remember his father. After all, what kind of a guy are you if your father is the guy who literally burned down the base of Mekdash? He was one of the generals of Tisha B'Av. You understand? Uh, they didn't come from a family where they, they loved Jews, let's put it that way. The Gemara? in its way, and I told you the other day, you know, you've got to know how to always take these stories, but the Gemara says, a famous Misa, where it says, Trajan hated the Jews for the following reason. This is what the Gemara says. His wife, and we have her, this is Plotina, a very famous Roman empress, okay? Uh, very aristocratic, she came from a high class family and all that. He married up when he married her. And, uh, you know, younger in life. And uh, so according to the story, this is not found in the history book, but according to the story, uh, she had a baby boy. The boy was born on Tisha B'Av, and the baby died on Hanukkah. So the enemies of the Jews had a more told story. And uh, uh, so the enemies of the Jews said, "See, when the baby was born,ing they were in mourning and fasting. And then when the baby died, they lit candles to celebrate. And then she said, oh, they hate me. I'll kill them all.' Right? That's kind of an oversimplification, obviously, but goes to show you the Jews were aware. That's the reason I share with you. Jews are aware that this particular emperor ain't no Nerva. You see." And so the problem is, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Whatever the case was, in the year 113, uh, Trajan moves east to set up logistics for a Middle Eastern war. Now, he was a real general. In the, in the play generals, the guy that play on the uh, computer games, uh, you don't have to worry about logistics. In real war, it's logistics, logistics, logistics. You can't fight a war unless you have the supply uh, depots ready, you have the roads built, you have the, um, uh, the ammunition there, obviously, the transportation has been uh, taken care of, 
uh, and all kind of a hundred other boring little things like that. Before Trajan went in the Dacian Wars, he spent a year on the Danube collecting boats and armor and all this kind of business, because that's really what it takes if you're in the real business of fighting, you see? Um, how did we beat the Germans after all? We had more of this and more of this and more of this than they had. The, um, uh, so he spent a year in the Middle East uh, building up the army. The Jews getting scared, 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 rightly so. In the year 114, uh, so keep the years now in mind. For the rest of what I'll be speaking about tonight is uh, three years, 114, 115, 116, and a little 117, three and a half years. Um, in 113, as I say before, he set up the logistics. In 114, he conquers Armenia. So here is the Roman Empire at that time. This is what, the, this is what it says the Roman Empire lo looked like after Trajan finished. So here was what I'm, what I'm pointing to with my pointer right now. It was where the Roman uh, lines were beforehand. And he said, I think this is Armenia. I can't see it. But this, this is our, so he spent a year conquering this area. That's actually the immediate pretext for the war because the Armenian throne had been held by the wrong candidate and Rome didn't like that, et cetera. But that was his excuse. You understand? But he did take out Armenia. Well, I'm trying to show you, this is a tough area. It's all mountains. And he did it. Uh, he was an amazing general uh, to cross rivers. He, he built huge fleets out of uh, rare wood and uh, of boats you could put together and take apart. It, it, it was a, quite a guy. I mean, the Romans had very sound engineering. I mean, it's, it works even today if you, if, if, if you, uh, you know, actually apply the rules. It's, uh, it, it's quite impressive from the strictly military point of view. So now that we finished the year 114, so now we focus on two years, 115 and 116, um, very important years. Uh, Trajan wants to move south into Parthia itself and conquer it. So having conquered this area, he said, let's go down here, right? This is the Parthian heartland. They call this area Mesopotamia. You and I today call it Iraq, right? There's the two. Mesopotamia means Aram Naharan, between the two rivers, Mesopotamia. So here's the Tigris and Euphrates River, and he wants to go down here. Uh, the place is swarming with Parthians, and this group and that group is not so easy. As I said before, he really was entering the Middle East hornet's nest like the U.S. discovered to its horror a couple years ago under George, George Bush. Um, anyway, so he comes in there, and uh, he does it. In the year 115, look what I'm doing. He takes the northern half of this, northern half of Iraq, right, halfway down through the country, which means it's hard fighting and, you know, a lot of campaigns, and, it's, and the weather is impossible. You know what the summer's like over there. And all this kind of, and he, and he did it. I mean, it's 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 really um, impressive. The Jews are the majority of the population in southern Iraq. I told you before, Bavel. It's not like today, of course. Bavel for a long, long time had the south part, what we call Babylonia. The north part is called Assyria. The south part of Babylonia for many centuries had a very large Jewish population, more Jews than non-Jews in these areas. The Parthian government didn't care, and the Persian government didn't care because they're both anti-Rome. Get it? The Jews are not a fifth column in favor of Rome. It's the opposite. The Jews are one group that never want to make peace with Rome. You see? So they're on our side. That was one of the ways that that situation worked out. Um, so Trajan, though, was now at their doorstep. So here's modern Iraq. So figure, look what I'm doing. Uh, here's Baghdad. So you go all the way down a little bit below here in, uh, in 115. Okay? So here's the Jews. The Romans are at your doorstep. Oy, oy, oy. Not funny. And so, what's going to happen now? Um, in late 115, or early 116, it's not clear, he captures Ctesiphon, which is the former capital of the Parthian Empire, later the Persian Empire. I know it's a household word, but Octisphon, as the Gemara calls it, they can't start with continents. Um, so, uh, 20 miles, 25 miles south of Baghdad, used to be the capital of this whole business, the famous uh, city. Um, the Jewish neighborhood of Octisphon is called Mechoza, which is often uh, discussed in uh, the Talmud and places like that. And uh, they're right in the Jewish uh, doorstep. That's what I'm trying to say. And he marches his army down, having taken the, the capital of Parthian sort of had to surrender, and he feels triumphant, and he takes his army down the river to here. So he wants to see, like, actually see with his eyes the Persian Gulf. You understand? And he famously boasts. He says, oh, if I wasn't only so old, I could do like Alexander, you know, the whole thing. And uh, he deposes the king of Parthia. He puts his own puppet on the throne, and he's triumphant, and everything's great, and then it's not. Then things start to unravel, just like happened to America a couple of years ago. We won the war, and all of a sudden we didn't. Because first, having conquered the heart of Parthia, a resistance movement broke out, a guerrilla warfare, and Trajan had to spend the rest of the year 116 fighting the Parthian resistance. 
which he eventually does defeat, but at a bloody cost. And you and I know from our own experience in America, you wipe him out, but then there's others elsewhere. And he kind of sees this. Clearly, uh, clearly, Parthia is not going to be a pushover, particularly with its unlimited Iranian hinterland, just like today. The Parthians was Iraq plus a, a, a piece of Iran, like a, a third of Iran. And so they can always go back into the Iranian territory. You can't chase them forever, forever, forever. And so it was really a problem. In addition to this Parthian attack, a number of cities, which he already captured, broke out in revolt, including most famously Edessa, Natsiba, and Seleucia. These are the cities right there. This is modern Iraq, they have Arabic names, but they're right over there. And all three of these cities, majority Jewish population. And so we already start to see over here the Jews, among others, kill the Romans. I mean, in each one of these towns, it's a movie, you know, they massacre the Roman garrisons. And then Prajan has to come back with the army and capture the city and sack the city, pillage, root, uh, you know, uh, rape and looting and all this sort of thing. And um, uh, he's got his hands full. He's got the Parthian resistance out there. He's got the cities in, res in, in revolt over here. How are you going to do this? He can't be at both places at one time. He has Jeb Stuart, his famous cavalry commander, Lucius Quietus. Um, Quietus, they call him in the Gomorrah. And his job is to take out these rebellious cities and wipe them out. Here's a Quietus right there, uh, which I can't see so much over here. He's in the front of the cavalry. This is uh, really cool. This is a picture of Trajan's column. If you go to Rome today, uh, surprise, surprise, two Roman emperors, uh, Trajan and Marcus Aurelius, each created uh, very expensive giant uh, uh, columns in which it's hammered out by artists the movie of the conquest. And so here you have the Dacian Wars in detail. It's, it's absolutely remarkable. You understand? And one of the things they show is the Moroccan cavalry, because Quietus was a Moroccan, and so a Roman Moroccan, Mauritanian, and uh, they are light, uh, uh, they ride lightly, not with heavy armor, and they're very good at what they do with the, with the spears and all this kind of business. And he was Jeb Stuart, without any question. Murat, if you're French. And um, he said, you take out these, these cities, these Jewish cities that are in revolt over here. Uh, he's got his hands full. The half of the army he's leading himself to fight the Parthian resistance. Uh, the other guys over here are taking out and fighting these cities that are in revolt. Uh, the bulk of the Roman army is involved in this kind of a war over here. And all of a sudden, 1,000 miles to the rear, 1,200 miles to the rear, Trajan gets a shocking news of a gigantic Jewish revolt breaking out through the, out the entire Middle East. Okay? <laughs> Whoa, how did this happen? What's going on over here? Um, here, he gets reports. Here's Cyrenaica. This is called today Libya. Here's Egypt, Israel, e Egypt. Right next is Libya. Libya is all three parts. Cyrenaica, Tobruk is over here, for example. And uh, once there was a lot of Jews living over there. The Jews, now we don't know enough what happened over here. I told you when I started tonight, I'm going to be speaking about a very sketchy period in Jewish history, which is fascinating. We'd love to know a lot more than to do. I could make it up if I wanted to, but I'm not in the mood to do that tonight. So let's stick to what we know. And the fact is, the fact is that we're told by the Roman historians that the Jews went wild. They got uh, Mayor Kahana to lead them, and they killed all the non-Jews living in Cyrenaica. They, they murdered them all, men, women, and children. I'm not finished. And then they went here, and they invaded Egypt. And they got to Alexandria, and they seized the city of Alexandria, and killed and pillaged and, and looted and all this kind of stuff, and particularly went after temples and burned them all down. They got Pompey's old tomb, which they wrecked and destroyed, Pompey being the famous Roman general, who, if you recall, was the first Roman guy to capture the base of Migdash, hundred and some years beforehand, revenge, you know. And uh, uh, they, went, they went crazy. At least that's what we're told, anyway. Uh, this is all he needs. They, all we, we know very little. Uh, Roman historians later and Christian historians recorded this. The Jews basically don't, which is kind of interesting, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I'm going to share with you a very famous account that we get from some of the Roman and Christian historians who wrote about this after it happened. But the leader of the Jews, uh, this Mayor Kahana type, Lucuus, no one's ever heard of that. And the Gomorrah, they talk about Seamus and Erdofim and not, you know, I mean, Seamus Mufakim and Seamus not Mufakim. What are uh, Greek names that Jews sometimes say? And one is Lucas, you know. But uh, this guy took it to a new level, let's put it that way. And they kill every Gentile in, in, in Libya. At least that's what we're told. So much so that when the revolt is put down, the new emperor has to move in new settlers to repopulate the area. You understand? It was really uh, tough. What we're told by Eusebius, who's a famous Christian historian who lived a little bit later than this, he says in Cyrenaica, I'm reading to you now, the rebels were led by Lucuus and Andreas. He called himself a king. Um, 
of the Jews. His group destroyed many temples, including those of Ecate, Jupiter, Apollo, Artemis, and Isis, as well as the civil structures that were symbols of Rome, including the Caesarean, the Basilica, and the public baths. So basically, anything that looked Roman, they destroyed. The, um, uh, the fourth century uh, historian Paulus Orosius records that the violence so depopulated the province of Cyrenaica that they say they had to move new people in to repopulate it later on. But, uh, but that ain't nothing. Um, let me say over here, oh, one more piece. The Jews waged war on the inhabitants throughout Libya in the most savage fashion, and to such an extent was the country wasted, its cultivators having been slain, its land would have remained utterly depopulated had not the later emperor gathered settlers and moved them there. But that ain't nothing. Dio Cassius, who's a very famous Roman historian from the next century, uh, and he's one of our main sources for better words even about Bar Kokhba, I'm sorry to say. So Dio Cassius records over there, and uh, look, I, uh, do we have it? Put it up there. Uh, no, uh, we don't have the text. I'll read it to you. It says like this. Uh, listen to this closely. Meanwhile, the Jews in the region of Cyrenaica put a guy named Andreas at their head, and they were destroying the Romans and the Greeks. They would cook their flesh, make belts for themselves from their entrails, anoint themselves with their blood, wear their skins for clothing. Many prisoners they sawed in two, from the head down. Others they gave her to wild beasts and made them fight like gladiators. So this is like one of these movies where they captured the Roman soldiers and said, now you see what it's like, you, know, you go fight the bear. You understand? In all, consequently, uh, a quarter of a million non-Jews perished. Uh, in Egypt also, they performed many similar deeds and in Cyprus, under the leadership of Artemio, where they killed a quarter million people, for this reason, no Jew ever can land in Cyprus. Anybody gets shipwrecked in Cyprus, they kill him. So what I'm trying to show you over here is some big Jewish thing broke out when the whole Roman army, as I just tried to describe in the tale, was fully occupied, had hands totally full in that hornet's nest of Iraq. And then all the way in the rear, obviously because the empire had been denuded of troops, right? The garrisons here were tiny. There was a Roman governor named Lupus in charge of Egypt. When these Jews came at him, he fled because they didn't have the troops to, to hold it. The Greeks in the city of Alexandria went wild, and they killed the local Jews who live in Alexandria. And this is our best guess of when they destroyed that famous synagogue that we all know about once upon a time was in Alexandria. You all know the story where you couldn't hear Romain unless the guy waved the flag. Remember that? It was a gigantic show, very beautiful, and all the rest of it, gone. Where did it go? It went down in this whole business of what we call what? What do we call this? You see? The Jews don't even have a name for it. And the Romans, it's like a bad episode because the main show was supposed to be in the hornet's nest in, in, in Parthia. Uh, the Egyptians, I say, uh, you know, freaked out and killed a lot of people. We have a few records of Romans saying, oh, the Jews were chasing me down the Nile. I had to swim for my life. It was, it was like really crazy. Um, they went berserk. It's what it is. Uh, at the same time as we just saw, some guy named Martimio, and I don't know what his Hebrew name was, led a huge revolt right here in Cyprus. Here's Libya, here's Egypt, and here's Cyprus. Right? And basically they killed all the people who weren't Jewish on the island, or a lot of them anyway. And again, the number's like crazy, quarter million, whatever. And uh, the result is, you have a major crisis in the rear at the moment when Rome is uh, weak. Now, Rome is very strong. They have a big army. They got the best emperor. Uh, everything's very well organized. As I say, the, the, the budget is in the black. Everything's going great. Yeah, but they took a big chance when they went into Iraq. Now, the Jewish sources tell us almost nothing about this. We know Trajan got freaked out by all this. Obviously, he had to send badly needed troops from Parthia to put these revolts down, which had the effect of draining his forces and making it more and more impossible for him to have any success in consolidating the conquest in Parthia. That goes without saying. We know from Roman sources that a guy named Quintus Marcius Turbo, who was a famous Roman of, of that time, he leads the suppression of the Jews, meaning he took the army back, the, the two legions, or whatever it was, back from Parthia down to here, and we don't know how, because we don't, but little by little, he killed all the Jews, quarter million of them, okay? So they killed a quarter million Gentiles, and then they killed a quarter million Jews, and wiped the whole thing out, uh, very bloody. He then went to Cyprus, and we don't know how, but he killed all the Jews. You see? And so obviously, the lack of records is really something that we miss over here. Uh, maybe we don't. Probably sounds like a very bloody kind of business. But isn't it remarkable that such a big business has escaped uh, the records? And there's almost no mention of it, almost, I repeat, no mention of it in the Chazal and elsewhere. Obviously, hundreds of thousands of Jews are killed in all of this. And this is 
before Bar Kochba ever started. What I'm describing to you takes place 15 or 16 years before the Bar Kochba rebellion. And so it's not taking place in a vacuum at all. And the Romans are learning to their uh, regret that the Jews uh, aren't just all you know, fish peddlers. You know, it's just, it could be a dangerous group sometimes or other, but the Romans aren't going to accommodate them. They're going to kill them. So it's a, a very uh, lousy time to be living in the Middle East, as if there ever is a good time. And uh, the question then becomes like this, what happens in Israel? I mean, we're, we're all the Jews in the Roman Empire? No. We know about this, we know about this, and we know about this. Right? We know about Cyprus and, and, and these other areas. Doesn't seem the other Jews were part of this. On the other hand, you know, inquiring minds want to know. Did they coordinate? Sounds like something was there. Why did they wait for the moment that Trajan was, you know, we don't know. It's, it's so uh, intriguing. You can write a hundred novels, I'm sure people have. And uh, the problem is, what's happening in Eretz Yisrael? Again, it's hopeless confusion if you try to decipher historically the rabbinic sources. Because I told you, the Chazal, number one, didn't want to talk about it too much. And number two, they didn't care about the facts. Or maybe they deliberately obfuscated the facts. Or maybe they didn't. You see? Um, all we know about is that there's such a thing in the there's one of the early sources, the rabbinic sources that are out there, one of the earliest books written before the mission even, is called Megillus Tainus, Megillah Tani. And it's a list of days on which you're not supposed to have a fast. Something good happened to the Jewish people. Usually they're Maccabean victories or something along those lines, and that's normal and we understand it. Um, but then you have sometimes not that way. And very intriguingly, one of these dates is uh, the 12th of Adar, right? The twelfth of Adar, the day before Tanis Esther, is called. Am I right? Am I not right? Trajan Day. No, I'm not sure. It says Betrena Sarbe Yom Turyanus. Now, this is the problem that I told you about the other day. It sounds like Trajan, but is it Trajan? Uh, and it can't exactly be Trajan, because what it says is that once upon a time there were two brothers named Papas and Lulianus, and uh, they were seized by Turyanus. And we're going to be killed. And uh, he says, "Avida Shetofa says Lulianus says Papus Balutkaya. They they captured him in Laodokia. Laodokia is in Turkey, up in Asia Minor. Uh, Omar and they said, or the the Romans said, Let's see if I can burn you and if you get a miracle, like this famous story in the book of Daniel, Daniel's three friends, Chanani Mishal Zayir, Nebuchadnezzar throws in a fiery furnace, they don't get burnt. And they answer him back. They say, first of all, they were tzaddikim." And we're not. So we don't expect any miracles. Second of all, they were put in by a high-class Gentile, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. You're a low-class uh, piece of thing. And, you know, so that's all they needed. And so they, they, they kill him. And then they say like this. They say, uh, And anyway, if our time, they give a fatalistic kind of answer. If it's our time to die, If you don't kill us, There are lots of lions and tigers and scorpions and that sort of thing. And we get killed that way. And we, we trust and that we'll get resurrected. You certainly won't. And the end of the story is he condemns them to death. And shortly thereafter, uh, messengers come from Rome and split the skull of the guy that did it, the Roman guy. What do we do with this story? Is this Trojanus Trajan? Trajan never, and why do they call it Trajan Day? Is it, like, if it's a day of Miguel's Tainus, it's a day, as we see in my show, they don't say Eri Tachnon. Where is Eri? The, uh, right? What's positive about that story? Now, when it comes to Miguel's Tainus, without getting too technical, there's all these problems about you know, if, which prices they're pulling down or all. There's another version of the story elsewhere, which makes more sense. And again, it shows you how difficult this all is. I don't want to bore anybody with the technical side, but it's interesting. It says a different story about Papas and Lulianus, about these two Jewish brothers who don't have Jewish names, but were heroes and martyrs. And they're called Harugi Lud because they were killed in Lud. They're the martyrs of Lud, where the airport is. And uh, the story goes that there was a Roman princess and she was murdered, and nobody knew who did it, and they couldn't find the, the perpetrators. And so the Romans said, no problem, we'll kill all the Jews. Right? In, in the country, maybe in the city, whatever, it is, we'll just kill everybody in uh, Roman style, in Stalin style, you know, just, just kill everybody. And, um, and they were going to do it. You know, to them, it wasn't a threat. Uh, they were going to do it, especially if you're talking about the year 115, 116. They're in the mood. Um, and so two brothers, this is how the story goes. Two brothers pop up on a step forward, and they say, we murdered her. Now, they didn't do it, but you understand what I'm saying? They did it so that they would take it and not anybody else. And they were killed, and therefore, 
or that's a different story. The Klal Yisrael was saved. That might be a reason why it's a Trajan day. I Meaning it's not your typical Maccabean victory, because you can't hope for that in the time of Trajan, but it's a, at least the, the end was good in the sense that so many lives were spared because of the heroic sacrifice of this. And ever since then, um, the Gemara very often says that Harugi Lud, um, let me put it this way, imagine heaven as a giant apartment building and everybody's got a room there, you hope. Uh, look, we'll settle for the basement, right? Uh, or the block. But uh, some of the high class tzaddikim, they get up there, you know, uh, 40th floor, 50th floor, right? And then you got the penthouse, you know, and you know, this is for Moshe Rabbein, all the rest of it. And harugi lud ain't kolbir yichol lamen But these two martyrs, no one can be in their section of heaven. Meaning, what they did, they literally saved the Jewish people with their sacrifice. So that's the story that we get in the Chazal. But Trajan wasn't in Israel. Never was, as far as we know. He was fighting in uh, Parthia. Maybe he sent that turbo guy over there um, to do it. I mean, he did. Was there actual fighting in Israel? Is he referring to another revolt that happened another time? You know, it's, it's, don't ask me, because no, no one can pull this stuff apart and try to fit it into the stories that we know. Is Torianus identical with Trajan, Trajanus? Maybe he's Turnius Rufus, the governor, a few years later, with Rabbi Kiva's time when, when Hadrian, and said, so that sounds like something that he would do. And was he killed? Who knows? It's hard to tell. Um, again, the Gemara talks about, the Mishnah actually talks about the Pulma Shalkitus, the uh, war led by Lucius Quietus, who I mentioned with that Mor- Moroccan Jeb Stuart. Okay? Um, and it's very famous. The Mishnah says in uh, Sota, I think it is, that uh, the Pumas show uh, Kitus, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but uh, they passed legislation as a result of the terrible killings that went over there. But quiet as Kitus never went to Israel. So I don't know how that works out either. Unless you say it had to do with his suppression of the revolt in Babylonia. Or, alternatively, I don't have all the facts, which is also possible, because we don't have all the facts. But as best as we can tell by the records that we got, quiet as Kitus, was up there and only afterwards came to be governor of Judea. So go try to make sense out of all this. One thing we know was a big mess. A lot of people got killed. You can't tell if anything happened in Israel. It makes sense that it would, but we would, we would think that we'd have better records than what I just described to you. And welcome to my world. So I mean it. And so uh, the result is that there was eventually a guy named Lucius Quietus, Lucius Quietus, governor of Judea. It is true, this is intriguing, that he was bumped off by the next emperor. So it says after he killed these three guys, they came and split his skull uh, from Rome. But you see what I'm saying? It's all, it's like archaeology. You have a strand here, a strand there. Can you make a chant out of all this? Who knows? Um, no, I mean, look, we can speculate what was happening over there, and I mean it. Because it's always easy to shoot the ball. You know, there, 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 there was a war going on. The Middle East was ablaze. The Jews were in major uh, violent mode. The Romans were coming back, killing right and left. Um, did Israel stay out of this? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I'm sure a shooting, not that I know, but I'm sure a shooting, some rabbi said, let's join them. Other rabbis say, you're crazy, don't do this. Uh, why did it break out at this moment? Was it simply because the Roman army was elsewhere? What did they think, that they could take over without the Roman army being there? Maybe they heard r- rumors that the Romans were killed. I don't know. Um, because I don't know, because nobody knows, people speculate a lot. What Dio Cassius just described, which was the eight people and boiled them and wore their skins, very un-Jewish. It's not, not the way we usually think of ourselves, but hey, you know what it's like to get in a war? You know, you, you ever know somebody, somebody's been in a war? You, you become an animal. Isn't that true? It could be a Vietnam, it could be World War II. You know, you're different. You have to be. You're a different person. And so, I, I, were feelings high against the Romans? Oh my goodness, right? Uh, if you had a Mayor Kahana guy leading everybody and say, kill, 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 it's possible. On the other hand, they took their entrails, whatever, I don't know, and wore them as belts. Um, did it happen? And bec- it, do- it doesn't necessarily sound right. Because of that, the famous from historian, but it's a guy, it's like a Levy, uh, Vigna Mill gives it in English, he, a, he said, the whole thing is Lo Hayyavali Nivra. Welcome to the Middle East. And when I was young, I used to say, he's just saying that, you know, because he doesn't want to see the Jews did it. On the other hand, you know, I can just tell you one sentence, so you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Remember they said that the Israelis killed that kid, and it turned out it was the PLO that did it, was on the photograph? Right. right. In other words, this is the world of lies. Get it? It could be they did it to the Jews, and they sign it and they say the Jews did it to them. It's possible. That's not beyond, you know, the realm of 
us, especially when it comes to the Middle East. Who was writing this? Dio Cassius, 100 years later, doesn't like the Jews. The early Christian writers who definitely don't like the Jews. Uh, you want to portray them as monsters? I don't know. You know that, it's a possibility. I know he's not saying it because he found other facts. He's saying it because it didn't smell kosher to him. And it might be right, it might not be right. I'm just telling you, it's a very controversial kind of business. But something clearly was going on in Trajan's time in the Middle East. That's all I can tell you. On the other hand, there are all kinds of problems with this. Uh, for example, why, what, what uh, Halevi says is, the Romans came and perpetrated massacres on the Jews. That's what happened. And they were looking for excuses to justify their killing of men and children. And so they made a whole story up, like a Hitler style, that the Jews were the ones who started the whole thing and killed all men, women, and children, and, and like the barbarians in Germany ripped over their entrails and ate them and things like that. They assigned this to the Jews and nothing but one big giant anti-Semitic plot and all the rest of it. I hear that, but why would they do it in 115? The whole Roman army was committed over there, as you know. Why would it happen in that year? Um, I have a better speculation. This is really delicious. Why did the Jews rise up against Rome at this point? Sounds like there was some kind of central control. One would sound like the Protocols of Zion, literally, you know? That there was some kind of headquarters saying, now's the time to... Uh, but it didn't happen all over the Jewish world. It just happened where I told you. In Libya, and in Egypt, primarily in Libya, and Cyrenaica, and, and in Cyprus. Why these places? Was there some particular Roman governor who really ticked them off? I don't know. Right? How did they organize themselves because Jews are not usually soldiers. How did they organize themselves under this Lucuus guy, Artemian and the others, and be so successful, whatever you want to say about it, that they could take out and wipe out a whole Roman armies and, and garrisons and kill all the population? I mean, how'd they do that? Why weren't they scared? You know, is the knife milchik? Is the flesh again of the old thing? How, did, how, could they, how could they do a thing like this? Was it simply because the region of the Middle East was denuded of troops by, by, by the war in, in Vietnam, as I told you before, in Parthia? Was there a grand conspiracy to save Babylonian Jewry? I've, that's very popular in a lot of history books. Get it? It kind of appeals to us. You know, I think it's baloney, but it's, it, it, it kind of appeals to us. It, you know, I'll tell you how it goes. And maybe you'll read it one time. It's kind of cool. I think in the art school they have it. Uh, oh, everybody knew that, um, as I told you before, the safety of the Jewish people lies in the fact that the entire colony is not under Rome. Here, this was in danger of happening. Moreover, moreover, Everybody knows, or at least the from historians assert, that Babylonia was the headquarters of Hasidic Judaism, of ultra-Orthodox Judaism. Israel, this is, this is how they say it, Israel always had its problem with sectarianism. You had Christians, you had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, this, that, and the other, Herodians. But in Babel, everybody was ultra-Orthodox from day one, never had any of these kind of problems. Therefore, the rest of the Jewish world was terrified that they should invade Meish Aram, so to speak. And therefore, in a self-sacrifice mode, they threw themselves into uh, what amounted to a suicidal attack on the Roman Empire because it did weaken and prevent Trajan from succeeding in conquering Parthia because we'll see soon he had to withdraw and the whole thing never happened and this Jewish revolt is a piece of it. It's not the only piece of it, as I told you before, it had to do with the Parthian attacks, but it's a big piece of it and therefore they sort of sacrificed themselves to save the Jewish people. I don't buy it. Uh, American Jews aren't going to give up their own lives for Israel. That's the bottom line. And Israel is not going to give up their lives for things. The Lithuanian Jews aren't going to get killed for the Germans. The Germans are not going to kill the Lithuanians. Maybe it ought to be like that, but that ain't the way it is. You see? And so it doesn't quite compute. Um, I don't know. We can't tell. Clearly something happened, but as I told you before, the Chazal and the rabbinic sources are pretty silent on the subject. Unfortunately, this revolt, which sounds like it was a big deal, lacks a Josephus. It lacks somebody to sit there and tell you the whole story. So even if we cut down 50%, there's still something left to give us a coherent account. We don't have it over here. All we know is Trajan had his hands full, right? And he's trying to suppress this and the other. And then, fighting in the summer in Iraq, his health broke down. He's getting older. Uh, his health broke down in the, in, in the fighting. And uh, he went back to Rome. No, he didn't. He died on the way home. Died in Turkey, in, in Salinas, on the southern coast of Turkey. He's a minor on the way home. Uh, leaving no heir. Okay? So, a uh, very interesting story over here because um, he was the great conqueror and then all of a sudden everything unraveled. This happened in the year 117. I told you 115 was northern Iraq, 116 was the other stuff that we've been talking about, but 117 is on his way home. In the back of his mind, maybe he's figuring, I'll come back one day and, get, and do this right. But his health was not good. He had heart issues, we're told, and stroke issues and things like that. Um, 
they say that he was besieging a fortress in Iraq in the summer without a helmet, you know, for hours and hours. You just imagine what that would do to a healthy person, let alone somebody who was in the 60s. And the end of the story is he kicked a bucket. And the result was, who's in charge? Well, uh, nobody was in charge. Wrong. The empress, his wife, Plotina, accompanied him on the, on, on the campaign. I showed you her before in the, in the coin. She left his uh, uh, deathbed, and she said like this, on his deathbed, my husband told me he adopts as his successor my cousin Hadrian. Okay? Because Hadrian. What Hadrian then did, let's see if the movie works. Can we get it to go? I just found this today. This is a dramatization. Uh, hold it. Stop it just for a second. Just for a second. Okay? Yeah. I'll tell you what it is, and then you'll see. I just found it say Everything's really cool out there, what they got now. This is not a, obviously a picture from long ago, but it's a dramatization of, a, an, a, of, of an emperor. Well, let's lie. Let's say it's from that time. Yeah. The, uh, okay. The, uh, uh, how many gullible people do we have? Yeah. No, but seriously, uh, this, this is a dramatization of a historic fact. A few emperors later, Marcus Aurelius. So it's, it's, it's Trajan, then Hadrian, and then Antoninus Pius. And when Antoninus Pius dies, this is 50 years later, and then it's Pius, so he left two adopted sons, uh, Marcus Aurelius and, and, and Verus. And so when they become the emperor, uh, they want the army to accept him. So the first thing, and, and, and it should have been no problem because they had been adopted, and all the four, and for 20 years they'd been adopted, and their legitimacy was uncontested, all the rest of it. Nevertheless, this is Rome, and armies like to get paid, and so the result is uh, they, uh, they give out cash, gold, to all the soldiers, Back to me. That's what Hadrian does. So they make no bones about it. Let's show this. Let's show the picture, if you can see it. These are the two princes. One's Marcus Aurelius, one's Verus. And here are the soldiers lining up. Everyone to get his cash, and the cash was equal to like three years' salary. Okay, not bad if you can get it. This is otherwise known as how they do elections in Baltimore, Maryland. <laughs> uh, not anymore, of course. You know, the uh, things changed in 2010. The, the uh, but, but it's, it's plenty of stuff. There's the gold. And, that, and, and that's how and that's how life is lived. And so uh, Trajan is gone, deified. Uh, the wife uh, made Hadrian the uh, what do you the, the next emperor. Uh, Hadrian was wise enough. Let's get the next picture. Hadrian, it was Trajan and his Hadrian. Hadrian was was wise enough to say the Vietnam War. I'll t I'll t he was wise. Listen, to what I'm about to tell you. He could have done an LBJ. And, and could have done a Nixon. We're not leaving until we leave with honor. Remember that? How long did we unnecessarily provoke the Vietnam War? Many years. You all remember, many of you, any remember what I'm talking about. The youngsters just uh, tune out. The, uh, <laughs> the uh, right? Uh, and you could say, it's American honor and glory, we want to really leave in the right style of rest it. Or you can say like this, I'm liquidating the business, <laughs> right? That's it, chapter 11, over. Because any money I spend from today on is wasted. I'm not wasting a penny. And that's what Hadrian did that. As soon as he became an emperor, he said, all the soldiers out of Parthia would just call that, you know, a, uh, a, a what did he say? That's a misadventure, or a I'm sure in business you have a better term, you know. And, 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 we're, and we're closing it down, and that is what he did. And so we're left with what from this era? In the rabbinic literature, it's also very interesting. The Mishnah in the Soto says that at the end, there's a problem with the gear says, but, if it, but those know I'm talking about, know what I'm talking about. It says in the Mishnah, that after the war of Vespasian, meaning after the war that culminated in the destruction of the temple, the Jews were so uh, shocked, all the rest of it, that in Jewish style, they adopted certain mourning practices, or at least a practice of restraint on Simcha, which is, of course, what we're doing exactly these days in the three weeks. Correct? Who invented the idea that you have no weddings in the three weeks? Not in the Gemara. It's not in the Talmud. It's not even the early Rishon. But, but, but it came to happen that Jews felt that there has to be, we don't fast for three weeks, right? But, I mean, some do, but, you know, I mean that, but, but uh, not anymore much. But you have some restraints on your simcha, correct? So, uh, the destruction of the temple left it, the Mishnah tells us, that Gazrael uh, Atoraz Chasanim, the Chasan uh, used to wear like a, a Roman garland or something like that, right now, Tara, you know, there. That was considered particularly happy. You know, he's a real 
uh, Melech and so forth. Uh, no, 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 not anymore. We, we don't do that anymore. That's what we have taken. And I realize you have to know the Mishnah to see that, but it's not, I'm not talking about something in the esoteric sense, it's a very exoteric type of text in Mishnah. And that's something that they cut down on the weddings. And also in the Eros, I think it's tambourines, if I remember. It used to be something like, you know, you see in the Middle East, they have very besimcha and all this sort of thing. Today, it would mean, I hope Nussi's not here, today it would mean you cut down on the bands. Right? Uh, as, uh, well, no, they didn't say wipe out the whole band, but wipe out the Eros, wipe out the tambourine, or what we say, I don't you know, the trombone or something like that. You know what I mean? In other words, the idea is saying, and this is very rabbinic, you can't go overboard, but you should do something. And so you don't get rid of the band, but it used to be a five-piece band, it's always a four-piece band. Something to that effect. Um, but Pumashol Kitus, as a result of the war that I just described to you, the war of Lucius Quietus, which they mean this whole business, Trajan and Marcus Turbo and all these killings, Gazrola uh, Torres Kalos, the bride always used to have a crown. The Chassan used to wear a certain type of atara, a certain type of crown, which obviously must have been very majestic looking. The bride did as well. And listen, when I'm, think about this. Even after the war of Vespasian, even the temple was destroyed, they took it off the guy, they didn't take off the girl. They said, that's going too far. But after all the many killings of the hundreds of thousands of women and children, as a result of these unknown wars that I just described, people were so feeling so bad about it, they said, even the girls should take off and shouldn't wear a crown when they get married. And also, shall Yilma, Yilami and Artemis beno Yivonis. And that they should uh, ban secular studies, as they would say today. No Greek language. Don't teach the kids Greek, which was the language of the Romans in the Middle East. Because in the West, it's Latin, and in the, in, in the East, it's, it's Greek. And you, it's, it's like an isolation. have nothing to do with these people, if possible. Um, this is what we had left over. Trajan, therefore, I conclude, was bad, but uh, Hadrian was worse. And uh, I'm sorry to say that, but that's the way it goes. And this is a story we will pick up in four days. Good night. It's, uh, I, I want to remember, so I keep forgetting over here. If, if anybody wants to, I think let's make a Meyer of Minion in about uh, seven, eight minutes. Like, give time. Uh, uh, there's a base manager here, I think, right over there. Am I right? So that's a nice little place. And we'll, whoever